without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Bruce Lyon. Bruce is a professor of evolutionary ecology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. His research focuses on the evolution of reproductive strategies and mating behavior of birds. He has done long-term research on brood parasitism to understand why it evolves within species and how it influences other aspects of social behavior. So we're really excited to hear more about that today with his work on black-headed ducks, but as many of you know, and I'll plug this, that he has also studied brood parasitism in American coots, as well as the evolution of ornamental plumage in American coot chicks. And he gave a great talk for us on that last year. Um, he's also going to talk on his investigation into the social lives of wintering golden crown sparrows that hang out at the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum. So I'll be sure to send links to those after the talk. Um, but in any case, we are very excited and uh, really looking forward to this talk. Uh, so welcome back, Bruce, uh, and I'll have you take it away from here. Um, I'll start with acknowledgments because it, it, then I can end with a sunset rather than a picture of my friend. Uh, this is, we were funded by National Geographic Society and we helped Attenborough get a clip for the life of birds. Um, and so they funded a field season for us to do that. And then lo lots of local people and field assistants. But John Eady here is a professor at UC Davis and we do work together and in fact, my interest in brood parasitism started when I was still an undergraduate and John Eady was a master's student in Canada. So we've actually been collaborating for 40 years and th this was a really fun project. All right, let's start with a quiz. Um, this is a wetland. We all have wetlands like this. this is, um, you can imagine where this is and what it might have. And I'm gonna give you a hint. This plant is the California bulrush. And so that might give you a hint sort of where, where we are. Marshes around the world look pretty similar, but th this is uh, our, our local bulrush. And those are uh, eucalyptus trees in the background, by the way. So you might, if sort of you see a habitat like this, you might think, what kind of birds would be here? And in California, we would see marsh nesting blackbirds, uh, depending on where you are in the state. Uh, Red-winged blackbirds, they don't quite look like this. Uh, in California, that's a picture from back east, yellow-headed blackbirds, marsh wrens, these are all very common um, wetland birds. Um, and of course, my favorite, American coots, they've made a living studying these guys. But this marsh actually wasn't in California. This is a marsh in Argentina. And there's a lot of birds that are very similar. So for example, um, well, I wanted to make this point, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas or California anymore. So we're gonna look at a marsh that could have been in California, but it's in Argentina. And instead of a yellow-headed blackbird, we have a scarlet-headed blackbird. Instead of a red-winged blackbird, we have a yellow-shouldered blackbird. So it's very similar, but it's a little bit topsy-turvy in terms of really similar things, but a little bit different. This, is, this one's very fun. This is a wren-like rush bird. It looks just like a wren. It builds a nest like a wren, completely unrelated. It's not even a modern songbird or, or an advanced songbird. It's an oven bird relative uh, from the Furnariad uh, group. And so, but very, very similar. Convergent evolution basically means evolved to be very, very similar. So it's kind of, it's, it's almost like the twilight zone where you feel like you're in a familiar place, but everything's just a little bit different. Even the coots are different. So this is a red garter coot. You can tell it's not an American coot. And some things just don't have ecological replacements. So here's a duck. We have ducks in our marshes in California, but we don't have ducks like this one. This is a really unique duck. And I'll tell you why. It's a black-headed duck. This is a baby black-headed duck. And what's unique about a baby black-headed duck is it never ever meets its biological parents because this is a species whose lays its, that lays its eggs in the nests of other birds. They never have their own nest. They are complete professional brood parasites. And so for example, that duckling might have come out of a gull nest. And so that one white egg is an egg of a black-headed duck and it's been laid in the nest of a gull. 
So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna sort of the different parts of the talk, I'm gonna talk about brood parasitism generally to set the stage for why we asked the questions that we did. Then we'll get to the study area. And because a lot of you are interested in wetland birds, that's why you came to this talk and why, um, and this is being given by the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. I'll just give a little sense of some of the cool birds found in the Argentinian wetland that, that we worked at. And then finally, I'll get to our study of the black-headed ducks. So brood parasites get other species to raise their offspring. And this has evolved independently in lots of different groups. It's common in birds, very well studied in birds like this cuckoo and reed warbler shown here. Uh, there's a catfish that's a professional parasite. It gets its eggs inside the mouth of mouth brooding cichlid fish and is raised by foster parents in the fish. And in social insects like ants, these uh, are slave making or dulotic ants, forms of this kind of reproductive parasitism are extremely common and it's been well studied. And so these are all organisms that parasitize the parenting behavior uh, of other species and basically get the parental care for free. And so in terms of how this evolves or why it evolves, these parasites have all evolved, if you look at the family tree of life, have all evolved from ancestors that cared for their offspring. So what they've evolved is a loss of parental care and fobbing their offspring off onto other species. And so we know that from, um, lots of different sort of taxonomic comparisons. And in birds, in terms of species of parasites that lay their eggs in other birds' nests professionally, there's 100 species. These are called obligate brood parasites. It's evolved seven times uh, in different groups. It's evolved in honey guides, in widow birds, cowbirds, twice in cuckoos. And um, actually, a, there's another, there's a missing species, a missing group here and once in this duck that we studied. I'll give you a little bit, bit of background on what these parasites do because it helps motivate the questions we looked at. Some species of brood parasites like the brown-headed cowbird, many of you will be familiar with that. That's a very common local bird here in California. At the species level, this is what's called a host generalist. Generalist means it uses lots of different species. And brown-headed cowbird eggs have been found in at least 200 different species of birds. So it's not very picky as a species where those eggs go. And it's successful in most of these species. A, a close relative of our cowbird is a South American cowbird called the screaming cowbird. And it's at the under, other end of the spectrum. Uh, by and large, there are exceptions, but this is a species of brood parasite that's completely dependent on only one other species, the grayish baywing. It's a related blackbird uh, to raise its babies. There's now some suggestions that this parasite may be using a second host, but by and large, it's dependent on a single host species. So it's a very specialized. Cuckoos are a, a bizarre example because the cuckoo is like the cowbird at the species level, its eggs are found in hundreds of different species of hosts, but there are genetic lineages of female cuckoos that specialize on different hosts, and they evolve over time to mimic their hosts. So these are eggs of five different European songbirds. Each of these has an egg of a cuckoo. So this, um, I think this might be a red start, that's a cuckoo egg that's been laid in a red start nest, incredibly mimetic. Here's a cuckoo egg in some, probably a reed warbler nest, also very mimetic. This is some other sort of songbird I don't know. I believe this might be a pipit. So you can see different genetic lineages of females have evolved to have highly mimetic eggs that match typically one species of host. So at the species level, this is a generalist, but at individual females, its uh, specialist. And this prompted some interest in how did this evolve? And I'll go through a hy hypothetical scenario of what, what we think went on. Once upon a time, way back millions of years, the prototype cuckoo was probably a generalist species like the cowbird that laid its eggs in lots of birds nests. It was very costly to those hosts, but 
um, it also did not have mimetic eggs yet because if, as you remember from the picture of all those different host eggs, different birds have different eggs. And if a species of parasite is laying eggs in lots of different hosts, it can't match them all. So early on, this would have been a, a brood parasite that, that did not have eggs that matched its hosts. And it's imposing a cost on its host because when a bird is parasitized by a cuckoo, that bird will only raise a cuckoo chick. It will not raise any babies of its own. So there's a huge penalty and strong benefits from evolving the ability to not raise a cuckoo. And what we see over and over and over again is that host species evolve the ability to tell their own eggs from a cuckoo and kick out those eggs. And that would have been easy early on when the cuckoos didn't lay mimetic eggs. But over evolutionary time, what's been favored as a result of this egg rejection by hosts is selection for the cuckoo to match the uh, host eggs and ev evade this uh, recognition and rejection. And so over time, what we've seen is the evolution of egg mimicry. These are three different species of hosts and there's a cuckoo egg that matches the host. This has happened slowly, iteratively, but once you evolve mimicry, you can't lay your eggs in lots of different birds' nests because they will recognize it. And so the evolution of mimicry itself leads to the evolution of specialization. If you've got an egg that evolves to look like a reed warbler, you're kind of you're kind of uh, tied to using that host species. So this is seen as coevolution, the, the two species, the host and the parasite, cause evolution in each other. And that arms race leads to the evolution of behaviors like egg rejection and mimicry by the parasites. So that's just one example. Another interesting pattern in, um, brood par in the brood parasites is all but one species of brood parasites in birds, obligate brood parasites, have altricial babies. Altricial babies are born pink and helpless and require enormous amounts of food by their, by their parents. This is in contrast to precocial Precocial uh, chicks feed themselves like ducklings or chickens. Any of you that have, have kept chickling, chickens will know that on the day the chicks hatch, they can run around with their eyes open and pretty soon feed themselves. And this difference in the requirement of babies for food by their parents has enormous implications for why parasitism evolves and potentially the nature of the interaction. And that's as follows. So, in altricial birds, like this robin shown on the left, um, the babies are fed by their parents. They're fed for several weeks. Um, all of their nutrition comes from their parents. In contrast, precocial chicks, like these golden eyes, feed themselves. And what they depend on their mother is perhaps a bit of warmth and maybe being warned about predation. Why might this affect the evolution of brood parasite? Well, you think about um, natural selection should favor individual birds that can raise as many chicks as they can because those are your genetic descendants. If you, a bird that can raise twice as many babies over its lifetime will leave twice as many genetic descendants, that will be favored by natural selection. What's shown here is the maybe the typical average annual output for an American robin. Each reproductive event, they can raise at most four eggs maybe get two batches of eggs in, in a breeding season, so maybe eight babies. So, um, and the eggs are fairly cheap, it turns out in songbirds, it's the babies that are expensive. Here's the annual potential output of a cowbird. We know that cowbirds can lay up to 40 eggs, maybe even 60 eggs in a season. Eggs are cheap for all these altricial birds, babies are expensive. And so if this cowbird can get somebody else to raise those eggs, you just compare the numbers she could have an incredible increase in her realized fecundity and the number of babies that she produces. And so this is a pattern that John Eady and I realized and we speculated that these fecundity boosts may be what explains why most brood parasites, why it's evolved um, and diversified more in altricial taxa than um, precocial bird taxa. And so, Going back to the pattern, we have 99 species of nasty brood parasites. Those are stealing parental care from their host parents. And 
we've speculated that these evolved because they benefit by huge gains in egg numbers. If they can get somebody else to raise their babies, it's, uh, it pays to abandon nesting entirely and become a brood parasite if, this, if the situation is, is correct. But then there's this one outlier that attracted our attention, this black-headed duck. And it's a, it should be a nice brood parasite. It basically doesn't need food from the parents. It needs a little bit of warmth to get the eggs uh, incubated. So uh, this sort of led us to be curious about the interactions between this brood parasite and its hosts, and also to wonder, is there anything special about this species that might explain why this one duck of all the waterfowl in the world has given up on raising its own kids and depends on other species to raise its kids. So this is sort of the goal of our study, was to answer these general questions motivated by the patterns I've just told you. And uh, there was one really excellent study done by Milton Weller, a famous waterfowl ecologist who went to the same area we studied the, the, the ducks at in Argentina, did a single year study and our study built on his, and the questions we were interested in, as in he, um, were how many hosts are used by this uh, um, species? Because it's nice, there shouldn't be an arms race between hosts and the parasite, so it should be able to use a wide variety of, of hosts because it doesn't requ require food, just requires uh, uh, incubation heat for its eggs. And because it's a nice parasite, the hosts should be nice. In, in return, there's, they shouldn't be having the sort of arms race we see in cuckoos and cowbirds. And if the hosts are nice to this parasite, it should have a fairly high uh, hatching success. This parasite should be pretty successful, uh, have a high success rate from the eggs it lays in other birds' nests. And then pure speculation, because there's no real, uh, with a single species, we can only speculate, but we sort of wonder, like, why did this species of duck become purely parasitic? Is there something special about the environment? So that's what we're going to talk about. This is our study site right uh, in the corner um, of Argentina, not too far from Buenos Aires, at, at, uh, near a small town called General Lavalle. And that shaded area shows where in South America the black-headed duck breeds. This is from Google Earth. Um, we, it, the area is like the Everglades. It's very flat lots of a mosaic of, of grasslands and wetlands that are just packed with birds as we'll see in, 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 a, in a bit. And we had uh, five different study wetlands where we surveyed um, for uh, hosts of this parasite and, and looking for, for eggs as I'll, as I'll show you in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, this is a place we stayed. This is a, um, a, a estancia or ranch, and we were able to convince the owners to let us stay in their fancy chalet. And as, um, it was a fantastic place to do our research. And if you pan back a little bit up in the upper corner, that's the same sort of chalet, but you can see we were right next to one of our major study sites. So we could actually walk out the door and look for nests uh, from, our, from our house. And this is taken from a, a a tower right at the at the ranch house shows that one of the study wetlands. You can get a sense for what the land is like. It's just a mixture of, of wetlands and cattle ranches. Before we get into our focus of the single species, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of a taste for what these wetlands are like. Uh, they have massive numbers of, of uh, I should say, a very high diversity of breeding birds, both water birds and land birds in these wetlands. I think I tallied something like 45 or 50 species of, of wetland birds breeding in these, in, in these particular marshes. So it was, it was pretty spectacular. These are black neck swans. This is a long winged harrier. It turns out these guys are colonial nesting harriers. They come in two color phases. So that was, that's pretty interesting. Lots of flycatchers in these marshes that, that are interesting. This is a, a polygynous bird uh, where males defend harems of females. They have that flashy yellow skin around the eye and they fly up and do a somersault and do a wing flick to attract females. So uh, a pretty unusual um, flycatcher. Here's another flycatcher, um, many colored rush tyrant. Males and females are similar and extremely colorful and they make these little hummingbird sized nests that they weave onto a single bulrush stem. And so this is, this is one of my favorite wetland birds of all. Very common. 
So if you go to, if you go to Argentina, you, it would be very easy to see this bird. More typical things, some that overlap with North America, there were colonies of uh, egrets and herons that had a few roseate spoonbills um, in them. This is a close relative of our least bittern. It's the straight back bittern. And it shows an interesting difference that I, I uh, would love to study someday. Least bittern eggs are pure white. This species of bittern has these pea green eggs that are identical in color to fresh bulrush stems. And we speculated that when the, the sunlight shines through the vegetation, it leaves stripes of, of dark shadow and bright and little bits of sun that look a lot like the bulrush stem. So it's probably for camouflage, uh, which makes sense because as I'll show at the very end, this is a dangerous world to be a bird. The, the number of predators that want to eat your eggs are very high. So there might be very strong benefits to having extra cryptic eggs. And then just weird things like the South American painted snipe. We had a few nests of these and interestingly, females are bigger and more colorful than males. It's an example of a, of, of a role reverse species, but very little is known about their, their biology. Uh, these guys, this is a southern lapwing. They've got weapons on their wings. Those little red pointy things are spurs that they can use to fight with each other. Um, and so a bit of an obnoxious bird, too colorful, but they're constantly flying and screaming and whining that you're too close to their nest. And last but not least, I couldn't uh, give a list of birds without talking about Argentina's uh, national bird. This is the Rufus Ornero or oven bird, and it builds this incredible nest um, out of mud with an entranceway that curves around. And so they, they're very well protected from predators and they get the wet mud from the edges of the wetland. So they count as an honorary wetland bird. And then there's our friend, the black-headed duck, and that's a red gartered coot uh, in behind. So it's two, the two ducks framing one of, their, one of their hosts. It turns out to be their most important host, the red gartered coot. And so just to remind me, this is, remind you, this is the goal of the study. We're gonna look at the patterns of host use. We'll see how hosts respond to the duck parasitism, and we'll look at the success of, of the of the brood parasites in the different hosts and then we'll briefly speculate as to is there anything special about these wetlands or the, these ducks that might explain why why it would benefit from being a brood parasite. So in terms of the way we do the study we would just put out we put out quadrats in, in these marshes and systematically look for all possible nests that might be potential hosts. So here we're here, John Eady and field assistant Vincent Muter are checking a coot nest. And what we're looking for is, is the nest parasitized? So this is a coot, a coot nest, there's no duck eggs. So that's a, a, an unparasitized nest. And then often we'll find uh, nests with duck eggs. And we're checking these nests constantly. So the eggs get numbered. We're basically following each nest through time to look at when duck eggs are laid, how many duck eggs are laid, whether they're successful, and if they're not successful, what happened to them. A little bit of natural history. Um, the ducks are very poorly studied. We would just see them in passing. So here's, uh, we, the observations that we made suggest that these birds are monogamous and occur in pairs because we often saw them in pairs. Occasionally we would see them swimming around looking like they were looking for host nests. Sometimes with the male in the lead, this is a case where the male was swimming through the vegetation and then that the female went off and looked, checked out that red gartered coot, but it was just on a little platform. It wasn't actually a nest. And I should point out, we have never, despite trying, we have never seen a black headed duck actually lay an egg in its host nest. That's something that we still would like to see at some point. It's fun to watch once the babies hatch, to watch the interactions. This is a red-fronted coot. Um, it's a second species of coot, looks a little bit like a gallinule, and that's a, a freshly hatched black-headed duckling. The ducklings stay in the host nest for one day to get dry, and then they leave home. And sometimes that leads to comical things. Here's a duckling feeding itself and about to take, take off from its host, and the coot kept trying to feed it. It's like, what's going on? This, this baby coot doesn't want to get fed. And so it was a kind of a, an amusing mis mismatch. And that's just to stress again that by the a day after hatching, 
these ducklings are on their own. Not only do they not get fed by anybody, they are completely on their own to raise themselves um, in this dangerous world. Here's a gull. This is a, a, a fun shot because it shows a baby gull and a baby duck that's hatched in this nest. And we wondered if maybe the ducklings return at night. So maybe they're out feeding themselves and maybe the hosts would uh, adopt them back at night. And in some cases, a few cases we saw ducklings after leaving the nest, even trying to return on the first day. And once those ducklings have left the nest, it seems like the hosts turn on a behavior, which is you can't come back. This is a gull that was preventing a duckling that had just hatched in its nest and had gone around for a swim. And the duckling was trying to come back and the gull said, no way. So it's kind of like when it's in the nest, the gull can't tell that it's a, not its own chick, but once it's left and wants to come back, it's like, oh, you're not a baby gull. You can't come to my nest. So that's sort of indirect evidence that these uh, ducklings are on their own. Here's a collection of a lot of different eggs from the local marsh. There's, as I said, there's an awful lot of water bird species and we just, the, the main uh, method of the study was to find every nest of every bird that could conceivably be a host of these ducks and to look at when they were parasitized. There were 40 species of nesting birds in these marshes. Um, I, I, I thought there was more like 50, but I guess 40. 15 were feasible hosts. And of these feasible hosts, that means they're, they're big enough, their they're incubation period is long enough. We found over 2,000 nests. And 11 species were actually parasitized by ducks. So this makes, might make you think, aha, this is a generalist. And here's, it's kind of cool. These are all the species um, in which we found eggs of black-headed ducks. And so just in terms of presence or absence, 11 species, it looks good for this being a fairly generalized breed parasite, but the devil is in the details. The numbers of parasitism actually tell a different story. So the question is, are they a generalist parasite? And it turns out that when you actually look at the, I think we found something like a thousand duck eggs. I can't remember the exact number. 93% of all duck eggs that we found were found in nests of just three host species. These two species of coots and the one species of gull. So from a numbers perspective, they're, they're pretty specialized. And so this one um, is the most important host, the red gartered coot. We found almost 400 nests, half of which are parasitized. So as I'll point, point out in a, in a little bit, to account for a lot of duck eggs, a species has to be common. There has to be lots of nests and a lot of those nests have to receive parasitic eggs. And so we can see that that's the case here. A very common bird, lots of nests and almost more than half of them are parasitized. And because we were surveying these marshes systematically, the number of nests we found is reflective of a species abundance. All of these nests are conspicuous. There's very hard for these nests to hide. So the numbers that we find are reflective of the overall sort of population. And so we're able to say which species are common and which ones are rare. Red gartered coots, again, over 350 nests, also a high parasitism rate. That accounts for a lot of eggs. And then uh, brown-headed gulls, uh, a little bit less common, um, but a, a moderate proportion of those nests were parasitized. So um, just re-summarizing re what I pointed out, 93% of all eggs that we found in our study were found in the nests of just these three host species. But then if you actually look at which of these hosts matter, red garter coots, account for 45% of all eggs, but because the hatching success is higher in this species, two thirds of all ducklings in our study wetlands were coming from just this one species of host. So from an ecological or, or numbers perspective, this is quite a specialized root parasite. It's critically dependent on, on mostly this one species. And so what I'm gonna do is summarize what I've just talked about is for a species to be an important host, it has to be both an abundant species, this is total number of nests, and have a high proportion of 
nests being parasitized. And that's the case. That's, that's a condition met by the three main hosts. And so for the other species that are not numerically important, there's two reasons why those species are not important. The first reason is they're too rare to matter. Even if they were parasitized at a high rate, for example, I think it was a limpkin, that 100%, there were only two nests. That does not add up to, so a high parasitism rate of a rare bird does not add up to very many duck eggs in the population. So these are all birds that are too rare to matter. And here's some examples, black neck swans, we only found 18 nests. They're huge nests, so there just weren't many nests. They're not that common as a nesting bird. Another strange swan, the Koskoroba, we only found eight nests. They were fairly highly parasitized, but that does not lead to a lot of duck eggs. This was an interesting one. This is a raptor. This is a snail eating bird, a snail kite. And almost half of the nests were parasitized, but unfortunately they were never successful because I would have loved to get a picture of a duckling in a raptor nest. That would have been quite fun. And then rosy bill poacher. This is a, an, an, a, a duck that nests over water and it was heavily parasitized, but only three nests. The second reason that birds are not important ecologically as hosts for this species is because even if they're common, they're rarely parasitized. They're not, the, the, the ducks are not taking advantage of these species. And I'll go through a, a couple of those because they're interesting. White-faced ibis nest in big colonies, sometimes in the thousands. We had one small, smallish colony of 200 nests, but only 7% of the nests were parasitized. And so that just does not add up to a huge number of duck eggs. Common bird, rare as a host. Screamer, only 5%. Screamers are primitive waterfowl, they're, they're, uh, or basal waterfowl, I shouldn't call them primitive. They're just weird. They're, the, the local gauchos say that this is a bird that God made with leftover bird parts, part vulture, part Dr. Seuss with its fancy neck collar. Um, they perch in trees, they fly around, they soar like vultures. And so we're not sure why they're not parasitized by the, by the ducks, but one possibility is screamers are heavily armed. Like that shorebird I showed you, they have these really big spurs on their wings. Uh, and those are, those are very hard and very pointy. And so it's possible that there's a risk of the ducks trying to get access to the screamer nest. Pure speculation. This is a fun one. This is a snowy crown tern, and we never ever found a duck egg in a, crown, in a tern nest. The reason this is interesting is because terns nest mixed in colonies of brown-headed gulls, totally mixed in. Sometimes we had a hard time telling the nests apart, but gulls were often parasitized while a tern nest right beside it was not parasitized. Both birds are very aggressive at defending their nests, so it's, it's unclear that it's because the terns are better at keeping the ducks away. It seems like one explanation for this is that the ducks are bird watchers. Terns would be too small to be effective hosts. It's unclear whether they could incubate a duck egg because the, the gulls are much larger than the terns. So this might be a case where the ducks, by being professional parasites, are really good at telling a good host from a potentially bad host. We would like to test this by putting duck eggs in turn nests and seeing if they could hatch. So this is actually a testable idea that would be fun for the future. So we've answered the first question. A big surprise was no, these birds are not very generalist. They're actually, they don't parasitize very many hosts and they're quite specialized. In fact, surprisingly dependent on one species of coot. And it seems like over their whole range, that's likely to be true. A study in Chile found that um, black-headed duck um, numbers in wetlands correlate with abundance of coots, not other birds, which suggests that those birds may be important hosts in Chile as well. So the next two questions we'll answer together because they, that the, um, the answer to both questions are connected. So recall we, we thought these are cute and fuzzy babies that don't take any food away from the coot, so the host should be nice to them. And if hosts are nice to you, you should the, the parasite should have a high hatching success. That's not what we found. The hosts are not nice. They actually kick out, reject, reject duck eggs. 
And those rejection rates range from about 33% for red gartered coots up to 60% for red fronted coots. Gulls are lower. And the way that they get rid of these eggs, coots bury the duck eggs down in their nest while the gulls kick them out outright. They kick them off of the platform. And so, oh, but in, in either case, once those eggs are out of the nest bowl, they're not gonna be kept warm and they're not gonna hatch. So this is bad for the ducks. And this is the result. So in terms of hatching success, um, the gray bar shows all, all eggs in these nests um, combined or in the black bars broken down by host species. Red garnered coots have the highest success rate for the black headed duck, something like 30% hatch. Uh, red fronted coots, it's below 20%, and brown hooded gulls, it's up around 20%. So there's egg rejection by the hosts, which in turn leads to low hatching success by the brood parasites. And most of this, most of this low hatching success is due to the behavior of the hosts. The hosts, as we'll see, actually are pretty good at hatching their own eggs. It's not that predators are coming along and munching these eggs. So this low hatching success is specifically uh, and largely due to the egg rejection by um, the, the hosts. So that raises the question, why are the hosts rejecting duck eggs? I won't bore you with the details, but we did an exhaustive study to try and figure out, are these duck eggs costing the host something? And we could not find any hosts, uh, any cost to the hosts whatsoever from incubating the duck eggs. And it was only in the it was in the last year when we were funded by the BBC to go back and help them get some footage that we realized we'd been thinking about this wrong. I had I had earlier studied American coots and was in such a hurry to move on from my thesis work that I really didn't focus on the coots. I was more focused on the ducks and the and the interaction between ducks and coots that I really I in retrospect, it was really silly of me to have missed what was going on here because it was directly what I found with my PhD work. So I'm gonna do a little digression to the American coot because it sets the stage for how we figured out what was going on. American coots lay eggs in each other's nests. This is a different form of brood parasitism. You can see these two brown eggs here laid by a neighboring coot and 40% of nests in, British, in my British Columbia population receive eggs from a neighboring coot or more than one sometimes. It's very costly and coots have evolved the ability to tell their own eggs from those of neighbors and they will often kick out the parasitic coot eggs. So here you can see two white coot eggs from a neighbor being pushed down into the nest. They will eventually be completely buried and they will not hatch because they will not be incubated. And it turns out that something similar is going on. There's, oh, those are the eggs that are disappearing. Turns out that once we started paying attention in Argentina, the hosts of the black-headed duck are doing the same thing. We just hadn't been looking for it. So Argentinian coots parasitize each other. Red garnered coots lay eggs in other red garnered coot nests. Red fronted coots lay eggs in other red fronted coots. This is a bare minimum. We re weren't really studying it. So this is the bare minimum parasitism rate that we could cobble together based on, on some preliminary data. It's probably more common than that. And hosts reject conspecific parasitic coot eggs. So in addition to rejecting duck eggs, these coots are rejecting eggs from other coots. And so what we concluded based on a variety of lines of evidence is that this duck is actually trapped in somebody else's evolutionary battle. That basically the parasitism within the coots led to the evolution of egg rejection uh, recognition and rejection of coot eggs, and the duck is sometimes collateral damage. Basically, the coots are not rejecting the duck eggs because natural selection has led them to respond to brood parasitism by the ducks. Natural selection has favored coots to recognize each other's eggs, and they will also target duck eggs as a result of having this ability to recognize and um, reject parasitic coot eggs. And so it's kind of uh, the poor ducks are, are, are stuck between a rock and a hard place or a coot and another coot, as the case may be. So it looks like we actually were wrong in almost all of our predictions. Um, 
we didn't find that this was a, spe a generalist host. We found that it was a, a, a specialist. We surprisingly found that hosts are nasty to the, the brood parasites, which results in low success. But this is not the result of an, an evolutionary uh, arms race or interaction between the ducks and the coots. It's more the result of coots on coots and the uh, ducks are innocent bystanders. bystanders. So I'll end um, with some speculation as to why black-headed ducks of all ducks evolved to be a complete brood parasite. And uh, as I want to keep stressing, this is speculation, but we can investigate some aspects of it. <clears throat> because um, for kosher birds, um, the babies feed themselves, it's thought that the number of eggs a female lays in her own nest is not so much limited by parental care, but by her ability to produce eggs. And with that, when, a, when a, something like a duck is emancipated from being a parent, it could probably lay more eggs, but it's not going to be the same fecundity boost as something like a cowbird. And so it seems like fecundity alone is not going to be an explanation for why these birds gave up on parental care, that there's probably something else going on as well. And it turns out that um, predation is incredibly intense in these wetlands. This is, this is the evil villain, Chimango Caracaras. We had a hard time checking nests at times without these guys um, trying to steal baby ducklings or coming for nests. And so uh, we suspected that the potential for predation rate, uh, for predation, in these wetlands was very, very high compared to other places that we've been. And it's also known, as I'll show you in, in a little bit, that ducks have poor nesting success in these marshes. This is a rosy bill poacher. They nest um, in the bulrushes as probably did the ancestor of black-headed ducks. And they have a very low success rate because they're nailed by predators. One idea is that if predation is very high in these marshes, Perhaps if a duck could get a bodyguard as a host, get something that's really good at defending its nest, it might be trading risky nesting on its own for a, a higher success rate in the, in, in the nest of some aggressive bodyguard type of bird. And as we'll see, uh, the hosts that they, these birds use are pretty aggressive and pretty good at defending their nests against predators. So um, here's an example. Um, Rosy Bill Poacher, this is from Weller's work uh, at a similar wetland to ours nearby a few years ago. He found, I think it was 16% hatching rate for Rosy Bill nests. It was a very small sample, but nonetheless, that's, if, it's, if it's representative, uh, you can see the difference between what a duck gets by net building its own nest and a red front coot, for example, and red garter coots are similar, um, very high hatching rate because red coots and gulls are very aggressive at defending their nest. And so we wanted to test this idea is like, um, is it really a risky world out here in these Argentinian marshes? So we did a, a very large scale artificial nest predation um, experiment where we made fake coot nests and we put out eggs in the marsh and then we put those same type of eggs in actual host nests in coot nests and gull nests and compared them. And basically the take home message was in our uh, artificial nest experiment, the nests, the, the eggs disappeared almost instantly. They didn't last very long. Virtually everything's gone in six days. Whereas the incubation period for a duck egg is, is 30 days. There's just no way with that kind of predation risk um, that a bird would be successful. And so just to resummarize what, what might be going on here is that all three hosts that are abundant, there are not only abundant birds in these marshes, they're really aggressive at defending their nests and good at it. Uh, if you, that the last thing sort of what this shows you, this 90% predation rate tells us the background risk if there's not a parent there tending the nest. And we know in general that ducks are really not always that great at defending their nests. So this is sort of telling us what the background risk of, of nest predation is. And then uh, the high success rate of um, coot nests and gull nests um, occurs despite a high background risk. It's because these birds are really good at defending their nests 
against predators. They're pretty obnoxious. They fight with each other. They fight with predators. So they, they, are, they are a good uh, bodyguard type of species. And gulls um, are famous for mobbing predators. And the gulls, uh, this is a European gull, not the gulls we studied, but their gulls are famous for basically creating a no-fly zone around their colonies. And interestingly, we put some fake nests with eggs in gull colonies but away from gull nests. So the nests were not actually tended by a parent, but they were in this no-fly zone in the middle of a gull colony. And the survival of those untended eggs was almost 100%. So simply being around a gull colony um, is good. And if you can get your egg in a gull nest, that's even better. All right, um, let's see. All right, so just to summarize, that's our bodyguard hypothesis for the evolution of brood parasitism in this bird. And the idea is that more duck eggs will hatch in the nests of aggressive hosts than would from a duck's own nest. And of course, some of the eggs are getting kicked out by the hosts. So there's the egg rejection factor, but these hosts are so good at having a high success rate that even despite getting some of your eggs kicked out, you still might have an advantage by laying in these bodyguard species as opposed to trying to nest on your own. And we're not saying that they have the option now, they've evolutionarily lost that option. What we're saying is that might've been a factor that caused natural selection to favor this bird evolving the behavior of not even ever trying to nest and always having its eggs in the nest, nests of other species. And so I think I'll end there. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. I thought that was an absolutely fascinating talk. I hope everybody agrees. And for me, having never been to South America, it was also really lovely to see that amazing biodiversity and many birds that I never heard before, you know, did not know they existed and it's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah uh, so we'll go ahead and take some questions here. So the first question uh, is from your friend, John. Do you know if any other stiff tails do facultative brood parasitism? Uh, how about freckled ducks or pygmy geese? Yeah, um, stiff tails are things like ready ducks in that group, and that's actually thought to be the sister tax. Uh, I don't know my, my understanding. John, John would know better. John's a good evolutionary biologist who knows his phylogeny. My sense is that black-headed duck is sister tax to that group. Um, ready ducks have been studied brood parasitism, but it's like coots, American coots, it's ruddy ducks on ruddy ducks. Um, and so I don't know if the other, if the, any other stiff tails have really been studied in enough detail to um, uh, answer this question, but I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. And then uh, another question is from Ronnie, who says, it's amazing to think that uh, parasites could evolve eggs that look like their hosts. This seems like a genetic miracle. Has this been researched at the genetic level to see the lineages of this development? It's a great question, but um, what I want to make first point out is it doesn't happen all at once. We see the end result, and so early on, the hosts would not be really good. They basically they would be able to tell, hey, this egg's red, mine's blue and speckled. And so they would have pretty crude recognition. And then the parasite just has to be a little bit closer. So it's kind of like this dance where you get close enough where you can't tell. And then you, the, the host evolves the ability to be more and more um, fine scaled. Um, the genes involved, um, I think that there's a little bit, there's a little bit about the blue, the genetics of blue egg morph in red starts in European cuckoo because I remember a recent paper. So it's, it's basically getting at the genes, not how you sophisticatedly uh, get at that. But it is, it is, it is, yeah, it's almost beyond belief. There's so much variation. So, uh, and the question is like, how does it do it? Does the cuckoo evolve the same exact genetic underpinnings? Like for example, that each of those host species, is it just, there's lots of ways you can make the same kind of Easter egg? Those are, those are great questions. And um, there's a lot of interest now in the genomics of cuckoo. So someone I'm sure right now is sort of looking at that. Yeah, I agree. It's it's kind of that kind of mimicry is mind-boggling to me. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then uh, when you were talking about the coot eggs that you studied, Diane asked, "Are individual coot eggs that really that different from each other, or the eggs of individual coots?" Um, so you can tell them apart. They are really different, and it's 
that at the population level, there's quite a bit of difference, but what makes this possible is individual females are extremely consistent in background color, speckling pattern, speckling size, and I actually use this to identify which coot females laid the eggs. It's like a fingerprint. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable. And the same is true for gallinules. A friend of mine, Sue McRae, worked on gallinules, and she found the same thing. She found that the eggs are distinct. I didn't do it. I did a small-scale genetic analysis. Sue did a large-scale genetic analysis to compare identification of parasites that she did on the basis of eggs and on the basis of genetics. 100% match. So that tells you, like, if you trust the genetics, her ability to match eggs to the females that laid them was 100% accurate based just on the visual appearance of the eggs, which is remarkable. So yes, they are different. And it's, it's a, once you train your eyes, you can get pretty good at matching eggs up. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, and then Ronnie also asked, um, what is the attraction to cootness for the ducks? And you mentioned that, of course, the coots are good at defending them. Um, but, you know, are there potentially other reasons? Like, is, is it easier to get in to lay the eggs versus other host nests? Well, the thing is, there's, um, it's unclear that they are attracted. I mean, they do avoid a few things. They avoid screamers and that, but that's the question we have. And, and actually we have the data to ask if when a female has access to lots of different species, does she particularly target the coots? And so I think, and, and over other things, and it might just be that this is just a super common bird and it doesn't have spurs on its wings. And so it, it, it may just basically, it may not be that picky, it's just using what's out there. Although the, the turn, the turn gull thing suggests that there's been some selection to not lay your eggs in really stupid nests that aren't going to be successful. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, related, uh, Ronnie asked, how long does it take the duck to actually lay her egg? If the coots are so aggressive, she would have to be pretty fast. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, cuckoos are incredibly fast. They've been selected for this. This has been studied because the longer a cuckoo spends at a reed warbler nest, the more likely it's going to be caught in the act by the reed warbler. And re when reed warblers see a cuckoo at their nest, their radar goes up. They're much more likely to kick out the egg. So basically the cuckoo is under strong natural selection to get in, uh, get in fast. Uh, I don't know how quickly a duck could lay an egg. That's a really good question. And I have no idea. Um, yeah, I would yeah. love to know. I would <laughs> love to know. Actually going back to it, um, Again, Sue McRae, who worked on the moorhens, was successful in watching several parasitic events in moorhens. It was at night. She used night vision video equipment. And people used to think that could sneak their eggs into nests when the owner was away. That's not what happens with, with or coots and gallinules. The female gallinules go to a nest where the male is on at night. The male's bigger than the female. She'll just sneak up beside him and he is beating the crap out of her and she'll just squeeze out an egg and then take off. So it, it may be something similar in the ducks. It may be that they just sort of go in. Um, but but the, the ducks disproportionately are good at getting their eggs early because if they lay their eggs after the coots finished laying her eggs, they're not, not going to hatch. So another reason for a slightly lower hatching success of duck eggs is they don't always get the timing right, but they're pretty good at it. So, and it might be then that the coots are not on their eggs because the coots might not be incubating yet. So it might be in the duck's case, they get it in early enough, they can sneak in when the coot's not actually on the nest to be determined. Wow, that's really interesting. Hopefully uh, you get to document that someday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and before we continue with questions, it is 7 p.m. now here Pacific time. So if anybody does need to log off, I wanna thank you for joining us, but we are gonna stay on for a few extra minutes to finish up the questions. We'll have the recording to you and you know, within a couple of weeks. So hopefully you can catch up after, but uh, again, thank you for everyone who has to leave. Um, yeah. But yeah, anyone who- I'm not leaving. Stay, <laughs> yeah, thanks uh, for staying on. So uh, the next question is from Jan. Uh, is the black-headed duck range limited to the range of these coots as well, or do they also use other hosts in other parts of their range? It's a good question. We don't, we don't have information. Um, I think they overlap quite a bit. 
with the coots. That's sort of the study in Chile found that a bunch of across Chile wetlands with lots of coots had lots of ducks. Wetlands without coots did not have um, lots of, of ducks. It's possible that there are parts of the range where they use other things. It's just without without an exhaustive study, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm imagining that coots are pretty important most places, but uh, and I can't think of something that would be numerically. The thing about coots is their densities are enormous. When I actually looked at the densities of American coots, for their body size, they're 10 times higher density than they should be based on what other organisms are. So coots, for whatever reason, they eat vegetation um, as adults. They are packed in there, which means their numbers are really high, which means that they are available as a host. I can't, I can't think of that many other, uh, other birds in these South American wetlands that might meet that criteria to be so, so abundant. Hmm. Um, and then uh, we had a couple of other questions about some other duck species. So uh, Diane asked if you happen to know about anything related to redhead duck parasitism on canvasbacks? Yeah, a friend of mine by the name of uh, Mike Sorensen, um, who does, he's now doing, he's actually involved in the genomics work with cuckoos and that, and, and widow birds, um, indigo birds in Africa. His PhD work was on the redhead canvasback. Redheads may have hit on an alternative to the black-headed duck. What's found is older female redheads will lay a complete first clutch in the nest of canvasbacks under good conditions and then have her own second nest. So basically they're, they're getting two complete clutches. And so when conditions are good, that's the case. And so, yes, that's, that's I, I don't know if there's been anything since then, but yeah, that, that's sort of the numbers game and the payoffs. Um, and Milton Weller, who studied black-headed ducks, was curious because he'd actually studied redheads too. He was sort of wondering why redheads haven't gone the way of black-headed ducks and did some experiments with American coots to see how that would go. But it, it just may be that with canvasbacks, redheads already have a pretty good thing going on. That's, that's pure speculation. Huh. Cool. And then uh, John also asked if, is the Argentine lake duck not found in this range or in your study area? It is, but it's really, really rare. And John, one thing we don't know is these wetlands are surprisingly low on waterfowl. So if any of you that have like compared to California or the pothole region of the North American prairies, there's just not a lot of waterfowl. And I don't know if that's natural or whether they're hunted. My colleague, John Eady was working at some duck hunting ranches further north. So the story may be different up there, uh, but uh, yeah, we were always shocked at how there's just not the same kind of numbers of ducks. And so I think we occasionally saw lake ducks, but very rare. Hmm. Interesting. And then uh, I think the last few comments were, were comments. So Barbara said wonderful photography. Um, yeah, and that it was fascinating. So um, yeah, John said, I, I vaguely recall that there's been some work done on host adaptation in indigo, indigo birds, but I can't cite anything. Well, that actually might be just just for the audience. Um, again, that's work done by Mike Sorensen, who did the redhead work. It's just he's he's a, just a spectacular scientist. Just everything he does in indigo birds. It's there was an interesting question as to like why is there only this in European cuckoo? There's these genetic lineages. Why haven't they become species? And it turned out that in the genetic analysis, they found that females a study in Japan, female cuckoos, each lineage is specific to a host, but the male cuckoos mate across types. And to get speciation, you need to have type with type. So the males are messing up basically speciation because males are willing to mate with any females that are reed warbler specialists, shrike specialists. What Mike found is that doesn't apply to the indigo birds. There's a built-in mechanism where type can find type. Indigo birds, um, the male and female learn the song of their host species, another species of finch, and that's how they recognize each other. So they're in, they, they're in a make up some species of finch, I can't remember. And both the male and female brood parasite learn that as their song. They still know they're indigo birds, but they go, oh, I need to find an indigo bird that sounds like a purple browed finch. Once you have both male and female, um, using the same rule, you can allow, that allows for a sort of mating by host type. So host species A, males and females find each other and that allows over time genetic differentiation and genetic analysis suggests that's led to 
speciation in the indigo birds. So the mating system difference between indigo birds and cuckoos um, has allowed uh, in one species, in one group, speciation in the cuckoos, it hasn't. So that's pretty, but I'm not sure that gets at John Hartman's question about host adaptation. I think they probably mimic the calls, other things, but I, I, I haven't followed that in the last five years. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, was the last question here. So thank you again so much, Bruce. Is there anything else you want to share with everybody? Well, someone mentioned the photography and it pains me. This, this work was done 20 years ago before digital cameras were on the scene. So these are all crappy scanned slides. It, it pains me that I didn't have my, I don't, didn't have my current equipment, <laughs> digital equipment to do it right. So I'll, I'll have to go back. <laughs> yeah, well, I am so happy that you were able to share this research with us. I thought it was so cool. And I hope you can return again and share even more of your work. There'll be more Argentina stories that to come out of the work in the high Andes at some point. Awesome. Well, we'll look forward to that. So right. thank you again so much, Bruce. And thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you at a future event and have a great rest of All your right. evening. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Mm -hmm.